Oh. All right, everybody. How are we doing today? Wow. Y'all are a lot louder amongst yourselves than you were answering that question. How are we doing today? <laughs> Good. Today, a couple of things. We've got a busy day today. If you don't know, today uh, we do have new members class. If you are signed up for that, immediately after church, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall. Food will be provided. Look forward to that time with you guys. Also, after that, meeting at the high school to fill backpacks for Give a Kid a Chance. So if you're available, that starts at 2, right, man? Starts at 2 and goes to 4. We're going to be filling backpacks over there full of school supplies for uh, kids. And next Sunday after church, no, nope, next Saturday, right? Uh, Saturday. Next Saturday, we will be meeting at the high school and giving those backpacks out to kids. So that's also a great time. Next Sunday, if you would, make sure you bring um, – Bring money to help with a for a gift tree that we're going to be making for Jay and Ty Williams that are that come every week, and then the following week I'm going to address two things on that week. That is our church um, birthday, so we're going to be having a potluck. I expect good food and banana pudding <laughs> for the potluck. Okay, and uh, also that same day we're going to be having a baptism. So y'all come, exciting times going on. There's a lot more. If you want to see the rest of the announcements, they're in the bulletin. There's a lot There's a lot going on in August. Also, our kids start school. So that's, let's keep that one quiet, though. They don't want to hear that part. So we'll keep that one quiet for now. How about that? Today I'm going to be reading out of Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It's very short. It says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. Thank goodness that everything is possible with our God. God, we come to you and we thank you today for the possibles that you give us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the grace and the mercy and all that you do for us each and every day. God, I pray that you'll just be with this time that we have to come and worship you through song and then through scripture that Matt's going to be preaching on. And God, I pray that you'll just be with him today in a special way. As he brings a controversial topic, as he brings topics from your word, God, I pray that you'll just embrace him, wrap your arms around him, God, and help him to preach your word the way that you would want it to be preached to us, God. We love you, we thank you, we honor you, God, with our words, our minds, and our thoughts, and everything that we do, and all these things. Amen. So we are down a member. Uh... I thought this was an old thing. I didn't know we were still doing this, but uh, COVID-23 uh, has taken out Mr. Jacob Davis. He's sick, not feeling well. Uh, he said he's feeling better, uh, but uh, he said he's feeling better day by day, but we, we wanted to keep him away from everybody, so he's at home worshiping. So uh, we're down a drummer. So if you, uh, in true fashion, if, if the Lord just fills you uh, and get, no, 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 you have to watch kids. Sorry, D. Uh, <laughs> Shucks, uh, but no, uh, it's going to be different, but guys, it's still worship. Amen? Amen. All right, if you want to rise and we'll sing some songs. Well, I searched the world, but it could Treasures and faith are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love.
mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only the second song, I want to invite you. It's everybody's favorite time of the week, right? If you are uh, seasoned here, if you are a member, you've been here for a long time, here's what I want you to do. During this next song, I want you to go around. I want you to find somebody's face that you've never seen before. I want you to tell them that you are glad they're here, all right? If you're brand new, if this is your first time here, this is the song you want to go to the bathroom because you're about to have a ton of people coming around telling you that they're glad you're here. So if you have social anxiety, run for the hills, okay? All right. There's a be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see, the only name that matters to me. The friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling on me The only name that matters to me Yours is the name, is the name that saved me Mercy and grace, the power that forgave me And your love is all I've ever needed Tell my story There will be one name That I proclaim Yours will be Yours will be The only name that matters to me The only one whose favor I see The only name that matters to me Yours is the name Yours is the name It's the name that saves Mercy and grace, the power that forgave me in your love is all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Let's sing Jesus together
up in the land of glory with the saints i will tell my story there will be one name that i proclaim creation we're at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference we spoke to the dark and flushed out the wonder of Child you die to save 
If you gave your life to love, then so will I. If you gave your life to love, then so will I. They're timid creatures, right? Right? Weak. Right? Nice. Gentle. Quiet. No, lions are ferocious. They are tenacious. And so now that we've professed Jesus Christ is our Savior, the girls are wearing shirts today that say you've got a lion inside. Guys, listen. I know you want to believe Jesus was a hippie. He was handing out flowers to everybody in complete peace and love. Guys, Jesus Christ loves you, and he has saved you from the wrath of God. Amen? Amen. But he ain't quiet. Amen? Amen. Listen, he ain't quiet. Amen? Amen. There you go, church. All right, when you're ready. We'll come on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Welcome on my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Last time. Well, come on, my soul. 
Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those bones. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Except for a heart singing, Alleluia, Alleluia. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, and we stand with our arms raised in the posture of surrender. Lord, and I pray today, God, that you would just work in us. God, I pray that you would just, if we are here and we don't know about our sin, God, I pray that you would wreck us. Lord, I pray that you would just do a mighty, mighty work. Father, if we're here, Lord, and we've loved you and we're on that mountaintop, God, I pray that we come in rejoicing, and I pray that that rejoicing is contagious. God, I pray that you would just bless us and fill us, and I pray, God, today that you would just help us to rejoice in you as our Savior. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we're trusting you to show up and do your work. Lord, we've just, we're just in awe that we get to be a part of this at any little bit that you have chosen us, the Bible says, as a kingdom and a priesthood, and now we get to partake in ministry, and we get to sit in your blessing and your glory. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we're undeserving, but God, you just, you love sinners. God, that's the gospel, and we thank you. Lord Jesus, it's in your mighty name we pray it all. Amen. All right, well, hopefully you're awake now, right? Not you? <laughs> Can't talk while you're asleep. All right, for you adults, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 26. Uh, for those of you ages 3 through grade 3, you guys can go back now for Children's Church. Uh, if you're a visitor here and you've got a kiddo, for ages 3 up through grade 3, you guys, thank you, babe. They get to go back for children's church. If you've got one younger than age three, Miss Alice is down that same hallway all the way down to your left. And as always, I like to mention, uh, if you're staying in service, keeping your kids in service, uh, just in case you need them, there's a room set up there in the hallway uh, where if they get a little rambunctious, you can take them. Also, as allergy season approaches, I will say, uh, that room is invaluable for those of us that suffer with allergies. If you get to coughing or you get to get too hot or whatever, uh, feel free to just step back there. All right. So I encourage you to sing as the worship leader. Now, as the pastor, I get to tell you that uh, some of you might not should be singing. Um, probably half of you should have just been standing there like this and, and, and not speaking. Um, 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. In your Bibles, there will be a heading. My Bible, uh, the ESV says, orderly worship. Okay? Uh, It'll be something to that effect. Now, let's stop here and let me say it's important during these next few verses that we remember. Sometimes you you can let this slide out of your memory and it doesn't really affect the flow of things. Right now, it's really important that we remember that when the original manuscripts were written for the Bible, there were no chapters, there were no verses, and there was no punctuation as we know it. Okay? So biblical scholars have had a really fun time trying to piece together where thoughts end and where thoughts begin. That was easier in the first century because they would write a letter to Paul. Paul would answer that letter with his own letter. And if they had any confusion, they could write a letter back to Paul and say, hey, you said this, we don't quite understand this. Like, what do you mean by that? And he would extrapolate on it. They'd go, oh, that's super clear. We don't have that luxury, okay? We don't get to write letters to Paul anymore. So now we are left with God's word, which is complete. But at the same time, we are left with God's word from languages that don't translate over to English super well, okay? And I want to tell you that because as we come out of this, we look at what we've been talking about with prophecy and tongues and love and all of those things. And actually, chapter 14, we did two weeks ago, it's all about speaking in tongues and it's all about prophecy and how you handle those in the church. And then we get to verse 26 that's just a continuation of that thought. And it says, What then, brothers? When you come together, each one of you has a hymn and a lesson, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation of that tongue. We have to let all things be done for building up. If there's any of you that speak in a tongue, let there only be one or two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and speak to God. And let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. And if a revelation is made to another person sitting there, let the first... or. Yes, if revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first person speaking be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to those prophets. And this is probably the most important verse in all of this that we've been talking about when it it comes to spiritual gifts. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. All right? If you leave a church service and you go, man, I don't have any idea what I just sat through. That's not the spirit of God, okay? God is not a God of confusion. If you sit through a church service and you're like, man, this just makes absolutely no sense. Now, that doesn't mean that God, that you won't be confused hearing the Bible. I read the Bible a ton and I get confused reading the Bible and I have to study it out and research it. But if you see a service, and you know what I'm talking about, those absolute train wrecks of church services, where you're like, this is a lot. There is a lot going on here. And people are screaming over each other, and there's just issue after issue after issue. The Bible says you can be sure that that is not the Holy Spirit working in that church because God is a God of peace and not a God of confusion. Amen? Amen. Now, we are human, okay? We are human. We muddy up the water, all right, because we are not perfect. And if you've known many humans, we are not, most of us, very peaceful creatures. We enjoy chaos. We create chaos. And so as we talk about this, I want to make special note before we get to the big topic that's going to get me in trouble. Listen, look, D went through throat surgery on Friday and we all were like maybe this is God's will that this no and she's still here and evidently still got a voice so I don't know uh, 
<laughs> Going to get a bag of M&Ms thrown at me. Uh, let's make special note of the address as we look at chapter 14, right? If we go back, okay? What then, brothers, when you come together, who has a song or a hymn? Each one of you. Now, we could say that Paul is addressing the men of the church, brothers, right? Brethren. I don't think that's true. I think he's saying that there is an allowance for each one of us, every person who is saved. I mean, not to be rude, the same Holy Spirit that resides in me resides in each one of you if you're saved, right? And so when you come together, each one of you is given something. Now, we have to understand also we do church way wrong, way wrong. If anybody ever tells you that their church is the right church, okay? All these other churches, they do it wrong, but our church, we've got it right. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you. We, we, we don't have this thing right. I can tell you that on the authority of you sit there and listen to me talk for like 30, 45, an hour, however long it is. Too long. There's like five doors to this church. Um... But so as you sit there, guys, you are listening to me give a sermon. This is the way it's done. Think about it this way. Have you ever been to a church where they did worship at the end of the service? Have you? I've never seen that. Right? Every church kind of follows the same formula. They may throw extra stuff in there or they may subtract some things. But all of us kind of follow the same formula. Listen to me when I say... The church that Paul is writing to, this would have been completely foreign to them. Get up, sing four songs. Two of them have to be hymns and two of them have to be contemporary because we've got to make everybody happy. Then everybody's going to sit down and the preacher's going to stand up and he's going to deliver this you know, 45-minute sermon that he's crafted all week. And then y'all are going to sit there and then we're going to sing Amazing Grace and we're all going to walk out and shake hands and, and go eat. Make. That, that's so foreign to Paul's writing. You have to understand, they are working on the Old Testament, which was known to who? Men. Okay? This is important as we go into this conversation. Young boys were trained up in the Torah. They read it. They learned it. They knew it. Young women did not have that same training. Young Jewish women were not trained up in that. Greek philosophers, as they philosophized together, who were they? They were men. Women weren't philosophers. In almost every culture that surrounded Judea at the time, that surrounded Jerusalem at the time, the men were educated, the women were not. The women's role was to be at home, to cook food, to take care of babies, because we need to have as many babies as possible. Why? Two reasons. Number one, they all didn't survive. Okay? Now we have a pretty good su su survival rate of children. Back then, you didn't. There were a lot of kids that didn't make it. Number two, we got farms to work. And not to be mean, I ain't working them with my three. Okay? I need me about 12, 13, 14, right? Because the three that are duds, maybe I get nine that are hard workers. Okay? <laughs> maybe I get some that will actually do something, right? But so the idea, especially for the Jews, right? Because the call from God to Abraham was what? Be fruitful and go and multiply. Okay? And so there's still this idea and this call inside of this church. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus comes, Jesus died, is resurrected, and ascends to the Father. Now we have the church age where we are seeing Jews and Greeks and Romans and pagans and everybody else come into church together. Okay? They have a lot of differences. It's messy. We also are working on the Old Testament, which the Jews are now trying to explain to whole new people groups, and they're trying to show them the God of the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfills those things. Okay? We're also working on manuscripts spoken, whether written or spoken oral new information from the disciples, right? Our church may not 
have Peter every week. But every so often on his journeys, Paul may stop in, John may come by, Andrew may come by, and we may hear from somebody who first person saw Jesus, and they'll tell us what happened, what he said, the miracles they saw. So we're constantly getting new information. The Holy Spirit is working really heavily in the churches, but everybody does church different. Okay? Modern day example would be if we tried to do an event all together, and it was us and the Pentecostal churches and the Catholic churches and the Lutheran churches, right? And the Seventh-day Adventists, which they won't show up because it's not Saturday. But like if we all showed up together and we're like, okay, we're all going to do a service and we don't want to put limitations on it. We want everybody to, to do it the way that you do it. Look here. And we're going to host this thing at St. John's. Because if you've never been inside of St. John's, it just echoes. And I want the Pentecostals to get in there and start hollering. <laughs> right? They're in there worshiping. Boy, they're screaming and shouting and doing what they do. Got their tambourines. And St. John's is just echoing and the priest is losing his mind in the corner, right? It would be chaos. Right? The priest is trying to hand out the, sac you know, the sacrament. He's trying to give the Lord's Supper and we're all hooting. And it would be chaos. Right? This is what they're going through. And so as Paul writes and he says, listen, every one of you has been indwelt with a gift. You all have a gift. And everybody wants to use their gift. But sometimes, and I tell this to our worship team a lot, music and service is not about knowing when to speak. It's about knowing when to shut down. Okay? It's about knowing when to be quiet. I have learned after I can't tell you how many funeral services to do what I need to do to eulogize, to speak about this person's life, to step away. And when I come down, I stand next to the door and I just stand there and I say nothing. If the family approaches me, I speak back. I learned that because at one of the first funeral services that I ever conducted, I made the mistake because it's just politeness, it's nicety, it's things that we say and we don't really think when we say them. I walked over to somebody and I shook hands with him and he was one of the family members and I shook hands with him and I said, hey, how are you? What a stupid question. What a dumb question. And he, he looked at me like, how do you think I am, right? And I quickly went, oh, I, I'm so sorry. And so I have learned in those moments when to be quiet. Our worship team, right, we practice on Tuesday nights. And we'll be, we'll be worshiping through songs. We'll be practicing through songs. And somebody will go, hey, I can't do this part. Guess what? Don't do it. Just stop singing. Put your mic down. Sing to yourself. Right? Sometimes in our culture, the ability to be quiet is lost because we all have something we have to say. Right? Look at what he says. When you come together... You all have these gifts, but let it be done for the building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two or three at most, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. We talked about this last week. I wholeheartedly believe that this is a foreign language. Let's just pretend and say that it is this angelic tongue that, that a lot of Pentecostal churches believe in. The problem that I have is when we sit in services, and I've been in these services, I've actually removed my youth group from these services, where the worship leader says, you know, if you've been given the gift, I want you to pray in the tongue right now. And about that time, 2,000 people started praying in tongues. Tongues. And my kids looked at me, and I looked at them, and I was like, let's go. Whether or not I believe in the tongue, it doesn't matter. The Bible gives us clear definition on how it is to be used and so many churches, even if you believe it's an angelic tongue, so many churches just skip over it and abuse it. It's, it's, it's right here. I mean, it's right in front of you. Let only two or three do it. 
and let them do it in turn, and there has to be interpretation. If there is no interpretation, you need to what? Keep quiet. Yeah, but I got this tongue. Great. It's not going to edify anybody. Yeah, but the Lord gave me the ability to speak in Vietnamese. And it's like, but there's no Vietnamese people. Hush. Sit down. Stop it, right? Well, the Lord wants me to pray this prayer. Does he? Or do you want to pray this prayer? The Lord told me I got something I got to say. Did he? Or did you just decide you really got something you need to say? Let two or three. When's the last time you walked into a church service and you only saw three people speaking in tongues and you saw them do it in order and you saw them do it with honor? It just doesn't happen. We just dismiss it. But look at what he says. Let two or three prophets speak. Two or three. How many prophets? Two or three. Okay? So if what I'm doing is prophecy... Modern day prophecy. I have taken the word of God. I have heard the word of God. I have asked God to, to expound on it in my life. I have asked God to let me speak it in truth, right? And so if there's two or three prophets that should speak, even if it is just a general revelation to one of you, we should only have how many of people do that in service? Two or three. Here's why I say we're not biblical. How many people do it in this church? One. So we're actually limiting because we should be opening. One of the greatest times you'll ever see this is testimonials, right? I'm going to ask a couple of you to give your testimony. I'm going to ask a couple of people to say, hey, would you just get up and share what God has done in this week with you? And we're edified and we're built up by that, right? You've had this tremendous week, right? We've seen our entire family come to Christ. I'm going to call you and I'm going to say, hey, can I hand you a wireless mic and you just tell people how great God, how, what, what great things God's doing in your life right now? That's edification. It's building up. But here's the thing. If one of us is speaking and another is set to speak. Now, do I think that that means if another person jumps up and just starts speaking, that the first one needs to be like, oh, okay. No. Why? Because God is a God of what? Say it with me. Order. Peace. Not chaos. Right? This doesn't mean that in the general assembly there's just people standing up and screaming and hollering whenever they feel like it. Elders and overseers are the positions of pastors. We call them pastors. The Bible calls them elders and overseers. What does it mean to oversee the church? It means that we come to you beforehand and we say, hey, your story would greatly bless the people in this church. Would you share it when we come together? Hey, I heard what you said the other day and it was spot on and it was amazing. Would you share that in service? The be quiet doesn't come when one person jumps up and usurps another. The be quiet comes when it's when the first person, you're done talking. When you're done, don't try to stand up here and cling onto the gravitas and the power and the accolades. When you're done, be done. And let the next person speak. And when they're done, be done and let the next person speak. And so we are built up by everybody in the church. So there's two commands already to what? Be quiet. Paul is writing and saying, for orderly worship, for a church that pleases God, what is the main thing we need to understand? We need to what? Be quiet. Right? As your worship leader, I go, come on, everybody, get loud. As your pastor, I go, hey, we need to be quiet. And you go, what sense does that make? Because God has given us the same song that we can all sing and worship to. But at some point, we need to know when it's time to be done. The spirits are, of prophets are subject to the prophets. Guys, if anybody ever tells you, I love this phrase, I was, carried, I was just carried away in the spirit. I got carried away in the spirit. Why were you running around the church in circles? Oh, I just got carried away in the spirit. Right? You see these videos, if you've never looked it up, YouTube is a fun place, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I'm picking on Pentecostals, man, because I know a ton, and if they want to argue with me or give me a hard time back, I mean, I'm sure they'd tell me I'm a boring snooze fest. But you see, you know, folks in Pentecostal services, the music starts, boy, and they got their arms out, and they're just swinging. I mean, it's like a death match. And they're swinging, and all of a sudden you clunk somebody that's walking by, and they're like, oh, sorry, got caught up in the spirit. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You're just acting foolish. You're just acting foolish, jumping around, screaming, hooting, hollering. Look, 
the prophet is in complete control. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. But the prophet is in control of how he delivers the prophecy. The Holy Spirit is not going to make you act like a fool. Well, David danced undignified. He was undignified because he was the king. It was undignified because he tore off his kingly robes and he went out and danced. The Lord is not going to call you in the middle of church to take your clothes off and dance. If he does, you need to find another church. <laughs> Praise God, right? <laughs> I mean, it's going to make for great Facebook conversation on Sunday afternoon, but please keep your clothes on, all right? The prophet is in control. What does that mean? That means you're able. You're able to control your words. You're able to control your volume. You're able to control your body. Now, here we go. Let's have a good time. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husband at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. As we get done for today... Uh, <laughs> Just going to let that one sit, right? What does it mean? Because the rest of these are straightforward, right? So we read this and we go, that's, that's really straightforward. Let the women be silent in the church service. You be careful with your amens back there in the back corner. <laughs> be careful, right? Why would women be silent? Why would women have to be silent? That's right. As James Brown once said, this is a man's world, right? Men are in control, and only men have the intelligence to be able to deliver. No, come on. Uh, let's, let's look at a few things on this verse, okay, because this is big. Because I asked these same questions about the verses before, and everything checked out, okay? Number one, is there a prohibition to all women speaking? So it says, let women be silent in church services. Is that all women? Okay. Number two, does it prohibit all speaking at all times? Is this a, just a declaration of be quiet? Does it prohibit speaking at certain times? Different question. Number four, what does the law say about women's subjection? Because in just a second, I didn't read this part yet, but Paul is going to talk about subjection, the created order of things. So what does the Bible say about women's subjection? What was the purpose, according to Paul, of women's speaking in church? Verse six, or number six, verse six, I've been preaching too long. What about women that have no husbands? Because the declaration was to ask your husband at home. Well, what if you don't have a husband? And number seven, and this one's probably most important. I say this all the time, all the time. If you're going to be at this church, you need to understand this. Context, not just the context inside of these verses, but the context inside of this book, the context inside of the actual canon of Scripture, all of the Bible. How does this statement gel with the rest of Paul and, more importantly, Christ's treatment of women and their ability to do ministry? Okay? Those are big questions. So here's where we're going to go. Ready? Ready? Number one, this verse cannot prohibit all women from speaking in church services. It seems that way on the offset. As in all the churches of the saints, verse 34, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church." The reason I want to camp here, the reason this is important, listen to me. I know this is not the gospel. I know you're like, man, I just wanted to hear that Jesus loves me and like go on with my life. Listen, if we don't hit this, if we just skip over it, if we are doing church wrong, 
we're doing church way wrong. I looked at Larry and I said, hey, you need to understand that if this verse says what it says, it's me and you on the worship team. And he quickly said, well, I'm not going to be here next week. I said, great, then it's me on the worship team. If this verse doesn't stand, then our ladies forget teaching men. Our ladies can't teach our children because they can't speak during a church service. So guys, if this verse holds true that the women have to be completely silent, you better get ready to do children's ministry and nursery. You better get ready to step up. Gentlemen, you ready to step up? That's what I thought. All right, so let's figure out why these ladies can talk. Okay. Shame on you. If you have your Bibles open, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. The baby Jesus is presented at the temple. Mary and Joseph have brought him to the temple to present him. And a side note here, uh, just a, a pastor's thought. The same high priest that they brought Jesus to to present him and the same high priest that blessed him as a child was probably the same high priest who yelled crucify him as an adult. So what a full circle moment for Christ. Verse 36, there was a what? Prophetess. Okay? It's 2023. They're trying to tell me that, you know, there's they's and them's and you can be what you want to be. Anytime you see the ESS on the back of the word, it denotes female. You are an actress. Men cannot be an actress. Men are actors. Men are prophets. This lady is a prophetess. She's female. And yet she has the ability to prophesy. Even before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, even before the day of Pentecost. She is a prophetess. Her name is Anna, the daughter of Phanuel in the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. That's a sweet way to say she's an old lady. Having lived with her husband for seven years from when she was a virgin and then a widow until she was 84. If you're 84, I'm sorry I just called you old. Um... So she married a man as a virgin. She was with him for seven years. He died, and in her distress, she went to the temple and dedicated herself to the Lord. I'm not going to love another. I'm not going to chase after another man. I'm going to go to God, and I'm going to solely be for God. And she is now in the temple as a prophetess. She did not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. This lady is talking. She's prophesying. She's telling people the good news. Right? She has seen the baby Jesus come into the temple and no doubt Mary has told her what is going on and she is telling people that's the Messiah. She's doing this inside of the temple. So the question we have to ask ourselves, is Paul being a Pharisee, a Sadducee, being a high-ranking official in the Sanhedrin, that's the group that kind of oversees, the Pharisees and Sadducees that oversee Jewish law, he's a high-ranking official. He's a high-ranking official while this lady is prophesying in the temple. He no doubt knows this woman. So he's allowing this in the temple as a strict Jew, but then under the freedom of Christ, he looks and says, all you women got to be quiet. Come on. That's crazy, right? I mean, we see how that's crazy. The same Paul who lived under law and allowed a woman to speak in the temple now looks at the church service and goes, every one of you females need to be quiet. That's nuts. When Christ saved Paul, we see Paul become super free. Not super religious, not super. And so we have to ask ourselves, is it a command 
that women just cannot speak inside of church. I don't think it is. Because in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul makes the comment, Paul makes the declaration when he's talking about headdresses that women, when they pray and they prophesy, must keep their head covered. And we know that he means in a public setting because in a private setting, there's no need for you because you're not under the subjection of anybody else. But he's talking about subjection, women subjecting themselves and saying, look, I'm not trying to usurp authority. And so they cover their heads. Guys, listen, when you look at people who are Islamic and you go, they're making them women wear them hijabs and we're... Stop. Because if you hate the hijab now, you're going to really hate the Apostle Paul. The Islamic reasoning for covering your head is the same reasoning that Paul shares in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Islamic women cover their heads in a reverence to Allah, who they believe to be God. Paul writes and says, listen, women, when they pray, when they prophesy, when they are in the public setting, are to cover their heads and to show subjugation. That was actually a thing for a long time, even in our churches. Women, you used to wear hats. You wore bonnets, not because it was sunny, but to show subjugation. Mennonites, the Amish, the women still wear small hats, and most of them, when they're in church services, will wear a veil of some kind as a covering. It's you heathen Baptists, right? Right? <laughs> It really has just in the past few years when somebody looked at you and said, hey, you don't have to wear a dress to church anymore. And you were like, whoa, pants suiting it up, right? And we'll take that line as far as we can, right? You walk in, you go, oh, preachers in blue jeans, wearing blue jeans, right? If I show up next week in shorts, half of you are going to go, he's wearing shorts. The other half are like, shorts, wearing shorts, right? Show up in my PJs. You're, you're showing up in your PJs, right? Whatever the line is, the question is not, should women have to cover their heads? Okay, that's where a lot of churches have taken it to. You should you cover your head. The question is, as it always is with Christ, where is your heart in this? At that moment, a woman who walked in and threw off her veil, threw off her covering, was saying, I will not be under the subjugation. I will not fall into this order. I will not do it. I'm going to usurp this authority. And Paul says, if there's a woman like that in your congregation, she has to be removed. Same reason here he says women must be silent. Does he mean all women? No, he can't. He can't because he says they can pray and they can prophesy. Anna was doing work. Uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, right? They have this church in their home and they're teaching Apollos and like they're training him up to be a good pastor. And you're not going to tell me that when the three of them are gathered because Jesus said where two or more are gathered, there I am. So that's a church service. And you're not going to tell me that, a, you know, Priscilla's sitting there just like, like miming everything. It's not happening. There are women who speak, so it can't be a general prohibition. So if you're worried, ladies, that you wouldn't be able to talk, take a breath and realize you're okay. You're okay. It cannot be a prohibition to speak at all times. Because we know, for instance, that the early church met together to break bread together and observe the Lord's Supper. They were called love feasts. Do we expect that the women, the whole time they were eating, remained silent? No. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, I should have put you, told you to put your little doohickey in there. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Go back to orderly worship, chapter 14, and look at verse 35. If there is anything that they desire to learn... Let them ask their husbands at home. Why would Paul put that in the middle of this? If he didn't want women to speak, he would have just said, all women need to be quiet at all times, period, and rocked on. And he probably would have wrote that to every church. We would have seen that probably in every letter. We don't see that. 
But he puts this phrase in the middle of this and says, if they desire to learn anything. So what is Paul saying? There is an issue, not with women speaking, but what? Women wanting to learn something. All right? Now, not to degrade you ladies, but we've already talked about this. Men were trained, understood. Imagine what it would be like if we are standing up and we are talking and we reference something from the Old Testament, right? right? We reference the book of Job and you ladies have never heard the book of Job and I just, I'm, I reference Job and I just trattle on and all the men are nodding in agreement and all the women are like, what is he talking about? And I can just flip through it and go, you know, we understand this from our father Abraham and the promise that God made to him. And the women are like, what was the promise that God made to Abraham? I don't understand. So now all of a sudden we start to understand what the prohibition is. Ladies, uh, John MacArthur also says this, that at this given time, it would have probably been that if there was a woman who was single or widowed, she probably would have sat somewhere on the other side of the general assembly towards the back. The men would have sat on the other side of the assembly all together, right? And, and they probably wouldn't have sat like this. They would have sat more circle-ish, right? Because we're not looking at one person. But the women who had children, see, this is the one thing we do do that's biblical. The women who have children, the children would have been placed aside because children are, as we all know and love, a distraction. So the women who had children, who were raising children, would have been with their children to try to shush them, to try to comfort them, to try to teach them, to try to explain things to them, to try to, right? And we've already discussed, you didn't have one or two. How many did you have? Fourteen. So let's say you have 14 kids, Kayla. <laughs> yeah, you think it's rough with four. You got 14, and they're all sitting with you, and Pastor Matt's up here talking about the glory of Jesus. We're going home. <laughs> she said, we're going home. We'll watch it online. But you wanted to be in the assembly, right? Because the command is forsake not the assembling of the saints. So you want to be with your church family. The women would have bound together, would have helped you. All these women would have been but they would have been separated. Guys, in Eastern traditions even today, our church originated from the East. Even in Eastern churches today, the men do not sit with the women. Once again, you heathen Baptist, sitting all together, sitting with your spouses, we're doing it different. And so because the men are sitting over here and somebody stands up and speaks, and these ladies who have no children may be able to hear... Those in the back would not have been able to hear. And if they had question, you know what's... We're, we're talking about orderly worship. We're talking about when to be quiet. If somebody is standing up going, let me tell you about the revelation of God, and all of a sudden a lady from the back goes, what is he saying? Hey, I can't hear. What did he say? God did what in his life? Right? And the kids are screaming, and she's like, hush! All y'all hush. What, what, what is he saying? You know, and all of a sudden the speaker's like, uh... And they're like, well, thanks, brother so-and-so. And he walks off. And the lady's like, I didn't hear a word of that, right? It's chaos inside of, inside of here. You want me to prove it to you? I'll send them a text and get these kids back in here. <laughs> we'll put these kids right here in the front. And I'll do the rest of the sermon. And you tell me what you learned. <laughs> Nothing. Right? Because these kids are going to be going bananas. And Heather's going to be trying to shush them all. And I can look at Heather after service and go, so what would you think about service? And she would be like, <laughs> I got nada, right? That's where we talk about. This is where Paul is coming in and he's going, look, these women have to be quiet in church. They're going to have questions, but if they have questions, let them do what? Ask their husbands at home. Because if you have kids, the general assumption is you have a husband who is hopefully more than likely at that time, in service with you because at this point, the woman wouldn't dictate what happens. It would be her husband. If the man said, I'm Jewish, then we're Jewish. If the woman said, I want to go be Christian, he could look at her and say, fine, I'll go to this Christian church with you and see what it's about. Or he could look at her and say, I want a divorce. And that's where we are. 
Ladies, you didn't dictate what happened. Men, you had the responsibility to be the spiritual head. You had the responsibility to accept Christ and then lead your family to Christ. So if we're going to go on a prohibition of women speaking, I'm going to tell you this. Men, the reason women need to be so loud in churches today in 2023 is because you're not doing what you need to do. And I'm not, let me stop pointing at y'all because y'all are here. Guys, I'm going to point at y'all on Facebook. You're not doing what you need to do. Your wife has had to step into a role that God never designed her for. You are the spiritual head. God gave you that command. Take that command seriously. Lead your children to know and love Christ. And so that's where we start to get this just crazy diversification in churches today. Is because back then it would have been full of men. And it would have been full of men who were engaged, who were seeking the Lord, who were standing up, who were speaking about their faith boldly and confidently. And it would have been filled with women who were happy to love their husbands because they saw their husband being used by God. But she was back there with the kids and she couldn't hear. And so she's asking questions and her husband looks and goes, baby, I'll explain it when we get to the house. Let them be silent so that it's not a disruption. Guys, I don't know if you expected me to tell you your woman needs to be quiet and you were going to cheer it on today, but it's not happening. (laughs) Could a woman pray in a church service in Paul's day? Yes. Yes, she could. She could. She could be asked for prayer. There are some of you among us that have a prayer Could a woman sing a song? Yes. Could she deliver prophecy as it was known in Paul's day? Yes. Anna was a prophetess. Can she, in Paul's day, exercise authority over men? No. That's the rub. She could not exercise authority over men. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Prophecy in Paul's day was something, some revelation that God had given you. But she wasn't teaching on that revelation. She could stand up and talk about how one of her kids had come to know Christ and she could talk about what Christ was doing in the life of her family and that was perfectly acceptable. We have women today who stand up after they go to camp with our children and they stand up and they give praise reports at camp. I've had women stand up and give testimonials in this church. Tell me what God has done in your life. And they talk about God taking them from sinners to salvation. And they talk about the blessing that God has been in their life. And that's all perfectly acceptable. Because at no point in the church service is there a woman saying, I'm usurping authority. And this may sound misogynistic. It may sound barbaric to some of you, especially in 2023. But God's word is clear. God... Christ, man, woman. There is a level. Christ submits to the Father. I, as a husband and a man, submit to Christ. My wife submits to me. If you don't understand what godly submission is, you don't have a godly mate. Because a godly man never has to look at his wife and say, your job is to submit to me. He won't have to say it. If a man is chasing after Christ the way he's supposed to, submission for the woman becomes easy. If the men in the church are doing what you're supposed to do, and if you are elders the way you are supposed to be, the women in the church have zero problem with the command that they are not to teach and have authority. You know why? Because they look at the authority in their church and they go, I trust these men with everything. I I know that these men are seeking Christ I know that Christ is in fellowship with the Father. And I have no problem coming in here and saying, this is my part, this is my role. The reason Paul says, hush, two times before this, is so that it lessens the burden on women to be quiet. And I don't mean to say that and sound completely bigoted. But I'll say this.
I need to know when to be quiet. Because as the overseer of the church, it's my job to make sure that this church functions smoothly, that she is edified by the other members, that she gives glory to God. That's my job. That's my purpose. But knowing good and well that you are saved by the same Christ and filled with the same Spirit as I am, that you play just as much a part in the glory of this church as I do, that if you come to me and you say, Brother, I'm... I'm excited to be able to tell people. For me to go, hey, I'm the one that speaks here. You need to sit down and hush. Guys, it's time for me to be quiet. Ladies, you are to be silent in the church services. Now, some of these things have corrected themselves. We now have children's church. We no longer have ladies sitting in the back trying to care for 95 children, right? We dismiss our children. So, ladies... You look around and you go, where am I supposed to sit? We don't have prohibitions that men sit on one side and women sit on the other. So you go, I want to sit with my spouse, which is a beautiful thing. Now you have the ability, hopefully still today, your man is still doing what he needs to do. And he knows the Bible better than you. And so as I'm preaching and you have question, you lean over and you go, what about this? And he answers or he says, hey, we'll talk about it at home. For those of you that don't have a husband, this is why it can't be a full on. There are many women here that don't have a husband. So what do you do? Who do you ask? The next in line I would say would be your father. Your father. Go to your father and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. What do you know about this in the word? If you have a grandfather, your grandfather, a godly member of your family, Then outside of that, outside of that, those elders and overseers in your church, you come to them and you say, hey, you said something, something was said, I'm struggling, help me to understand this. And those elders come together and they're all in agreement and they say, this is what is meant by that passage. And we see that God, the God of peace, not the God of chaos, We see everything done in harmony, everything done for His glory. We see it all done in beauty, right? And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I do want to finish this chapter really quickly. There's not much more to say because we've already hit the tough verses, but I do want to talk about this. As in all the churches of the saints, we've read that. Uh, Verse 36, or was it from you, you, the Corinthians, that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached. If anybody thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. And if anyone does not recognize this, he's not recognized. So brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. We see this Beautiful ending there. If you have your Bibles open, just for a second, Philippians chapter 4. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get here, if I was going to have time. I'm glad we did. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and verse 3. Ladies, I want to cleanse your palate and leave you with a wonderful parting gift. Who wrote the book of Philippians? Paul. To the church in what? Philippi. This is one of Paul's letters. The same that he wrote to Corinth. He wrote to the church in Philippi. And he says this. I entreat. And I'm going to butcher these Greek names. Iodia. And I entreat. Sintichi. To agree in the Lord. These two women have been fighting. They've got a squabble between them. And he says look. My prayer is that you two would get along. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women, so we know they're women, who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. 
Paul wrote a letter to the church at Philippi and said, listen, these two women are squabbling. I've heard about it. You need to tell them to put their differences aside and get back to the gospel because they have been what? Great co-workers with me in the gospel. How in the world are women expected to be great co-laborers in the gospel if they can't talk in church services? They can't. Paul looks and says, look, ladies, you have a very specific and beautiful purpose inside of the church. My own daughter at 15, she said, Dad, when I grow up, can I be a worship leader? I said, yeah. She said, really? She said, can I be a youth, a youth leader? I was like, yep. She's like, oh, that's great. She's like, can I be a pastor? I went, nope. <laughs> Nor do you want to be, darling. But no, you can't. You cannot exercise authority over men. The reason you can be a youth leader is, at what age does a man become a man? For a Jew, it would have been 13, so you couldn't have been a youth leader. For us, we consider manhood to be 18. I would say if you walk in and you have a youth group full of boys, 18-year-old boys, and you're a 19-year-old female, you probably shouldn't be the youth leader at that church. We're asking for a load of trouble. But ladies, listen. Use your voices. You've been given a great gift. The church is better because of you. And so if we read these verses and we run through them at face value, and there are, there are churches out there that still to this day tell women they cannot speak at all, cannot utter a sound. I just find that difficult. The first person to tell of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the assembly of disciples was Mary Magdalene, a woman. She came into the meeting where they were praying and announced the resurrection of their Savior. Christ loves women. Amen? Amen. He desires for you to use your voice. Gentlemen, if you thought this was going to be a bashing on the ladies, it's actually a bashing on you. Gentlemen, if we step up and take our roles more seriously in church, you will find that this passage, along with a whole bunch of others, makes way more sense and becomes a lot easier. It's much easier when men are stepping up in church to be able to say, Hey, ladies, we love you, and we're going to make sure we got it covered. And all you have to do is come and enjoy and use your gifts to edify the rest of the church. That becomes easy. The other thing that makes it easy, guys, and I'm just going to end it with this, because we are in 2023, when we understand what a man and a woman are. Because if a woman is being told she has to be quiet, you don't know if you're a man or a woman, guys, listen. This is where we're heading. And I don't mean to get all social justice, but like this is where we're going. A woman who identifies as a man that now when she reads the Bible reads that she can have all authority because men can have all authority and I'm... No. Stop. God designed you with very specific purpose. And when you try to usurp that purpose, your life becomes chaotic and disorderly. When you realize that purpose, your life is filled by the God of peace. And your life becomes peaceful. Guys, listen, I know we haven't touched on it today, but I want to touch on it before we leave. Jesus Christ died for each one of us, male and female. The Bible says, now there is no male and female. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave and free, but we are all one through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. The same Jesus that died for me died for you. If you haven't accepted him as your Savior, let me tell you, he's not a God of hatefulness and pain and oppression. He's, he's a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness. And He extends that, forgiveness, that forgiveness to you today. If you need a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say amen. We're going to be dismissed. If you need a relationship with Christ, if you know you're a sinner and you haven't dealt with that sin, you haven't humbled yourself and come before God Almighty, if you know that He's tugging on you right now, you can feel the weight of that. You come find me after service and you say, hey, pastor, I need to talk to you. And I'll know exactly what you mean. We'll sit and we'll talk about sin. We'll talk about salvation. We'll talk about glory. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Father, I thank you that 
God, when you saw Adam and you said that he was very good, that the only thing you found in Adam that was missing was woman. Father, I thank you for these ladies created to be helpmates, created to be side-by-side ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for these women who use their voice to praise you, who sing songs of praise. And God, I thank you that you clearly in your word established to us the order of things over and over and over and over again so that if we ever have question, Lord, that we can come back to your word and find answer. God, I pray for those that are here today that may be confused on their role. God, I pray for those seriously, God, today that are confused in their body. They're confused in their place. God, they don't know if they're man, woman. They don't know, they don't know these commands because they don't even know who they are. Lord, we've heard that you are the God of peace. And so I pray, God, that you, the God of peace, would give them peace in their lives, that you would show them the truth and that peace would come because of it. Father, I pray today for everyone here. I pray, God, for those that are going to stay for membership classes. I pray, God, that you would just fan a flame, ignite in them this passion to glorify you and to edify their church. Father, I just pray, God, that you would watch over us. God, that you would continue to lead and guide and direct us. Lead us, individually lead us in this church. God, help us to glorify you. Lord, we love you. I thank you and I praise you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that the whole church says, amen. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.